So you may notice the name switch here. Uh, Mike Mills uh, had a family event in Chicago. We thought the session started at 10. Turns out it starts at 1, so he had to catch his 1 o'clock flight. Don't know how he could have done a 1 o'clock session with a 1 o'clock flight, but so be it. My name is Justin Thurlow. I live here in Minneapolis, and uh, we're making up titles today, so I'm a senior technologist. Um, you could also call me the Grand Poobah of all things absence, or a title I've preferred many times is Supreme High Commander of the Great Plains Region. So that one's gone over pretty well. Um, I know we're not supposed to swear. I will use the C word. Uh, I did work for Citrix for 11 years. And at Citrix, we had, uh, in the corporate office, one of the engineers, one of the developers there at Citrix, had a sign on his cubicle that said, if you don't work for Citrix, you're just an end user. And that's what we're going to talk about today a little bit is end user management. Um, managing the user experience, managing user security, managing user performance. That's what we do here at AppSense. I always like to start off with a little bit of humor. Did a Google search, clicked on images, did a Google search on secure and productive. Came up with this. Not sure how it applies. I really have no comment whatsoever, so we'll just leave that alone. Some of the trends we're seeing in the industry these days, and we've been talking a lot about these things all day. Uh, cloud computing, seeing a lot of customers want to move their things up into the cloud. Windows 10, how many people have migrated users to Windows 10 yet? A couple of people. How many of you are evaluating Windows 10? That's good. I'm running it in my lab. Our stuff runs on Windows 10 already. We have a lot of customers uh, facilitating some migrations from Windows 7 to Windows 10. Uh, planning on implementing Windows 10 pretty soon. Windows 10 solves all of your problems, so don't worry about anything like the crypto lock or anything like that. It does not work at all. Total lie. Works perfectly. I just downloaded CryptoLocker.exe in preparation for a demo. Put it on Windows 10. Runs. Runs like a champ. Crypts files just like it always did. Virtualization. Obviously, we're here to talk about VDI. A lot of companies are doing a lot with VDI. What I've seen in the industry is that VDI is, uh, as Sean mentioned, not so much about capital expenditure, a lot more about operating expenditure, right? The amount of cost and resources that it takes to build a desktop that is virtual are fundamentally nearly identical as those costs and resources are to just provide somebody a physical desktop. So where do you make the gains? You make the gains in the long run by reducing your overall management. One way to reduce that overall management is by having VDI sessions use less images. I uh, have you know, uh, some app stacks involved so that we can create a set of packages of applications to provide to end users. We think that uh, the notion that one size fits all in computing is fundamentally untrue. If you were to provide brand new workstations for your employees from Best Buy every single day, that wouldn't make them more productive. That would make them less productive. Users have a level of expectation that the stuff that they did yesterday is going to follow with them from yesterday to today. And when they make changes to applications, that those changes will follow their user. Nothing is more frustrating than changing your signature, giving yourself a brand new title, promoting yourself to the grand poobah, going into Outlook, changing your signature to the grand poobah, and then the next day you log in and you're a senior analyst too again, right? So let's go ahead and keep our promotions and let's uh, have end user settings follow them. Uh, we're seeing a lot uh, of talk about containerization and layering of technology. Uh, just listened to Jim Yannick's session on application layering, and we're seeing a, a, a lot of uh, potential in the industry for providing these layers of applications. <laughs> now, the thing I'm still missing is why because I'm not exactly sure what the benefit is if we still have all of the same interdependencies and we have all of the same application conflicts and we have all of the same application licensing issues, then fundamentally all we're doing is providing the same applications in just a slightly different way. So now I need three additional steps without a whole lot of additional gain. So I'm not exactly sure where the gain is yet, but I'm sure it will be there and when we figure it out, I'm sure somebody will tell us. Uh, we are seeing a lot of shifts towards mobility. Uh, a lot of companies are uh, now delivering applications to handheld devices. Obviously, Citrix was a big leader in this space. 
VMware is, has now a ton of solutions in this space as well, packaging up your applications, which are still fundamentally Windows applications and delivering them to mobile platforms. Now we're securing them in new and ingenious ways, but we're still relying on Windows-based applications. And something that we're starting to see new challenges in the space for, security. We have seen so many organizations uh, be vulnerable to ransomware attacks recently, um, and all types of uh, threats from uh, internal releases to uh, just brute force hacking to all different types of malware and ransomware have um, caused organizations to take another look at how do we secure our platforms. Uh, just by show of hands, how many people have, have users in their organization that are administrators on their own computers? Just by show of hands, you can admit it. Look how many other people are raising their hands. Okay. Almost everybody has end users that are still administrators on their computers. Now, uh, let me ask why. And that's sort of rhetorical, because I'm not going to make you stand up and tell me why. I think I know the reason why. The reason why is because they have to for some particular reason. There's something on their computer that they do on a daily basis, or an application that they run, uh, or a business process that they are privy to that they have to be an administrator on their machine. Well, we have a technological solution for that, and we have a component of our technology called Application Manager that can elevate a user for any control panel icon, Windows resource, application launch, web page, URL, anything that uh, requires the user to be an administrator, and you can show me, here's an administrator running the application, and now if I take away administrative privilege, it no longer works, I can put my tool in and elevate for that one particular function. And when the user runs that one particular function, they become an administrator, but just for that one function. And so we can resolve that problem. We've helped many companies get rid of administrative uh, privilege across the board and get back to where users are simply end users. So we see that the world is getting harder and harder. We have more stuff to manage, right? We now are starting to put our applications not just on the endpoint machines, but into stacks of applications. We're taking those things of stacks of applications, we're trying to put them into the cloud, and we're trying to access them from all different types of devices. And what we're seeing is that creates more different attacks in the, um, in the industry. For example, we have seen at uh, corporations not just blatant crypto locker, but we've seen things like uh, sending attachments via email that look like uh, an integrated Outlook attachment. And then when you open the Outlook attachment, it's actually an XE. And it got there because it was an attachment, not an XE. So all of the virus filters and scanners just let those things right by. The user clicks on the uh, XE and launches it. And whether they're an administrator or not, they can potentially cause introduction of these types of malware. We've also seen where uh, companies are starting to hack your DNS. And they're starting to redirect you from Facebook to a different site that looks like Facebook, and it says, hey, uh, before you can log into your Facebook account, we need to verify some things about your identity. Corporate policy is that you need to now download this little executable if you're going to be uh, connecting to Facebook from work. And then they have you enter some information. Sure enough, that actually goes to the Ukraine. All of a sudden, you've now uh, uh, been hacked. Um, Recently, we saw in Hollywood, there was a hospital that actually forked over the money to just decrypt their files because it's almost just easier to pay them off. It's sort of like if you had a loved one that was kidnapped, it's very much the same thing. Sometimes we love our data, and so we'll just pay the money because it's the easiest way to do it, right? So higher level of user expectations are being driven in this type of world, and we think we've got some solutions that can fundamentally help. So on the user side, there's some significant pain that we can help with. Some of those are around personalization aspects that I've already talked about. So I don't want the same computer every day. Uh, I need to be able to do some things to do my job. Like for example, I have to go buy a new printer uh, because ink is so expensive. Let's just buy a new printer. They're disposable these days. Um, I need to connect to all different types of resources. Uh, I'm having a hard time making a determination over what applications are good, what are bad. My machine is too locked down. I can't do the stuff I want. On the IT side, there's uh, challenges as well. We need to be, within IT, able to help stop these outbreaks, uh, reduce the risk of ransomware, uh, reduce the footprint of who are all our administrators, and we need to do this without impacting user productivity. How can we do those things? Well, we think that, uh, that there's challenges related to user experience. And this is just a funny little example of the difference between 
what a designer thinks and what the user actually does. Uh, in, I think if you're thinking about Windows, this would be UAC, right? Um, UAC was designed to get rid of administrative privilege. Uh, in reality, it actually went the other way. Um, it just produces a help desk call. As soon as your user launches an application that requires administrative privilege and says enter in your admin, console, uh, admin password, all they do is just call the help desk to get the admin password. Now the help desk just either gives it out or uh, whatever, but the point is users will do what they need to do to get their job done regardless of what you've intended for them to do. So we need to build around user expectations, not around what the software uh, has been designed to do. So. We have some solutions in this space, uh, endpoint security, managing the desktop experience, and managing performance and scalability of VDI platforms as well as terminal server-based platforms. So within uh, the endpoint security, we have a lot of functionality around our application manager for whitelisting, uh, privilege management, uh, network access level of control, uh, trusting certain vendors, uh, trusting signatures, Enforcing licenses and license compliance and providing contextual access are all a part of our endpoint security play. Within the user's desktop experience, uh, we are the leaders in this space, user environment management. Uh, we manage user profiles in a centralized way. We store user profiles in a SQL server and we scale up to hundreds of thousands of users. Uh, there's an organization uh, in the Twin Cities that runs 110,000 users live managing their profiles centrally on a SQL database using AppSense. We replace all login scripts to get users logged in significantly faster. Uh, I think in the industry, average logon times are right around a minute. Uh, with AppSense customers, uh, our logon times average between 10 and 12 seconds. Anything faster than 10 seconds is a liar, uh, or they're using some kind of uh, uh, contextual fast user switching. Uh, like when you're using Improvata tabs, you know, like tap and go kind of things. You're already sort of pre-logged in. Citrix has that kind of pre-login session. Um, likewise, uh, with, with VMware, if you're logging in and there's an entire profile load, getting that down to 10 seconds is, uh, is, a, is a noble goal, and getting it much further is usually a, a, a fruitless effort. Um, providing contextual policy, again, which printer should I have when I'm connected to which floors, solving problems around group policy, uh, healing applications, putting icons where they belong on the desktop, making sure that the start menu is consistent from machine to machine. All of that are all elements of desktop experience that we control, manage, and also monitor and report on at AppSense. Performance management is about scalability, CPU, memory footprints. Uh, we have a customer in town that uh, was every single week having 15 to 20 phone calls because they have an application that would cause lockups on servers and that number went down all the way down to zero. And it's because of the performance management capabilities to clamp either applications that run away with CPU or applications that run away with memory. Increasing your user density across uh, terminal services platforms as well as all VDI platforms. Drive up your user density on Horizon by about 15% by, perfor by performing application control over these poorer performing applications. Applications like, you know, the things that you've never heard of before, like IE and uh, Outlook, for example. Um, Excel macros, uh, Google Chrome. These applications, even though everyone uses them, they are very poor performing. They are bloated applications that run away with CPU and memory, and we can help those uh, with our technology here at AppSense. So, just three easy steps to implementing AppSense. There's three easy steps to pretty much everything. Uh, I've learned this uh, all, all the days of my life, morning, noon, and night, uh, past, present, and future. So three easy steps, make your reality, step one, step two, three is your goal. Uh, solve all of your pipe problems. Again, these are wacky little Google searches on three easy steps, video pinpoint and choose. And three steps to becoming an expert in anything, part three. So step one, three step approach. One, user experience, two, user analytics, and contextual security. So let's talk first about that user experience. We think user experience should be consistent, accessible, and automated. So uh, our environment management capabilities 
capture the settings of a user and make them relevant across all different types of devices. So we've helped customers migrate off of one hardware platform onto another hardware platform, or off of an operating system like Windows XP to Windows 7, Windows 7 to Windows 8, Windows 7 to Windows 10, uh, who, who's on Vista? Everybody on Vista? Not one? Didn't think so, okay. So, um, manage migrations centrally, control what follows the user, and get rid of all of those bloated user profiles, and you'll find your user experience uh, is improved significantly. So that's user experience. Two, user analytics. Uh, we have a component of our technology now called Insight that is a very lightweight agent that can gather metrics around what the user logon time looks like, which applications require administrative privilege, who is using which applications, how much CPU, how much memory, uh, how frequently those applications are launched, uh, when they're making system calls that require administrative privilege, like when they're changing their resolution or changing their date and time or doing any of those kind of things, they, could, they will report up uh, through our Insight tool, which is around user analytics, and it'll give you answers around uh, what that user experience looks like. So we think that's step two, collecting that kind of user data. And step three, contextual security. Quick, easy, flexible user security to control the, the spread of this type of ransomware and uh, malware. Uh, one of the ways that we do that is called trusted ownership. And trusted ownership is providing a method of trust of what applications should be launched in an environment. So when we're trying to secure an environment, I'm sure many of you have heard of some of these terms, whitelisting, blacklisting, uh, crowdsourcing. Uh, I like to think of security a little bit closer to home. Okay, because I'm a dad, I've got two little kids. I like about thinking, thinking about, you know, how do I secure my house? Now, I started off with a question about administrative privilege. Let's, let's think about the house example. Uh, we have a lot of people now that are starting to invest in Nest because we can not only control the temperature, but we can also put up cameras, we can see everywhere. Uh, I'm pretty paranoid, I built a moat around my house. <laughs> but I don't lock the doors at night, okay? Because, you know, it's too hard unlocking the door every time you go in and out, right? In my mind, having your users be administrators on their own machines is like buying as much security as you can for your house and then just refusing to lock the door at night because it's just, it's just too hard, right? So uh, we should lock our doors at night, right? Let's go ahead and take away administrative privilege from those that are just simple end users. Um, but whitelisting, blacklisting, and these kind of crowdsource methodologies, I don't think they really make a whole lot of sense either. So as an example, so again, I'm a dad. Uh, when I leave, should I give my kids a whitelist of everything that they're allowed to do while I'm gone? Well, that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, right? I mean, I need to provide for all these different scenarios under which they might you know, need to do something. Do I, what if I forgot that I should put on there that they can call 911 in case there's a fire or something like that, right? So I, I probably shouldn't make a list of everything that my kids can do. Uh, how about blacklisting? Should I, should I just make a big long list of all the stuff that they can't do? Well, that's probably an even worse idea. I'm sure that would give them all types of ideas of things uh, that, that they should or shouldn't do. So then, then security companies have been saying, well, let's, let's leverage everybody else. And let's have this sort of crowdsource model on all of the executables that are good. And everybody else can start saying whether they're good or bad. So me as a parent, when I leave, I should just tell everybody in the neighborhood, hey, I'm leaving. You know, just, just help me keep an eye on my kids. We'll, we'll source that out to the crowd. That's probably not a really good idea either, right? So what do I do? I hire a babysitter. I bestow a model of trust to another entity. And so that's what trusted ownership is. Trusted ownership is, let's look at what they're launching and make intelligent decisions about it. Was it installed through an improved methodology? So who owns this file? Was it installed by System Center? Was it installed from our corporate file share where we've put our corporate approved applications? Was it, was it something that was provided to us from Apple or from Microsoft or from one of my trusted vendors? Does it have a certificate uh, that I've already approved? If so, then allow that file to run. If not, start off with a deny, but then allow the user to request into the help desk that they're able to run it. So that's what we do is with this model of trusted ownership. We've had companies on day one of CryptoLocker get a deny message when trying to open up an attachment because it had a CryptoLocker virus in it. We had no idea what CryptoLocker was. We just had developed a way through patented technology of stopping applications that we've never recognized before and saying to the user, you're not gonna start up this process until somebody approves it. 
And so that's what trusted ownership is. And again, it can help protect against those kind of ransomwares. But you have to get past that first step of step one. We gotta lock our doors at night and take away the administrative privilege from end users, which is something that we, we can help you do with this contextual security that is application manager. So this is the product portfolio at AppSense. Uh, at the top, we have our environment manager. Uh, an environment manager is policy and personalization, setting up drives, printers, uh, environment variables, mappings, all those kind of things for end users, as well as the settings that they're changing inside of their applications. We'll capture those, store them in SQL, and make them relevant across all different types of devices, regardless of whether they're on their local machine or whether they're launching a Horizon session or whether they're launching a published application. It doesn't matter, those settings will follow that user. Uh, application manager, that's what can help get rid of your administrative rights as well as provide contextual controls like trusted ownership and provide things like license enforcement. So Sean's example from earlier in the day, uh, Visio and Project, nobody wants to license Visio and Project for everybody in their enterprise, but everybody wants them to be a part of their golden image so that if a user that needs Visio, the, the, the Visio application is there for the end user. So our application manager can just say, hey, these are the 10 people, these are the 10 devices that I've licensed Visio for. If you're connecting from one of those 10 devices, Visio will show up. If you're not connecting from one of those 10 devices, Visio won't be available for you to run. If you do try and run it, you'll get an error message saying that you're not licensed for that particular component. Uh, Data Now allows users to access their stuff from anywhere. Uh, it's a way of providing enterprise synchronization that's accessible from handheld devices, browsers, uh, and it's a, a, a way to share uh, content. Performance Manager is a great tool to accelerate user density and eliminate problematic applications from consuming too much CPU or memory. Insight is the analytics tool. And uh, the Absence Management Center touches all of that makes it easy to deploy out the software and provides reporting infrastructure for all of the tools that are AppSense related. So that's the full product portfolio uh, here at AppSense. Let's talk just a little bit more about endpoint security and our application control. Now I've spent quite a bit of time on this already, so we will move quickly through these slides, but we provide application level control as well as contextual policy for security. Um, and we call it best in class uh, application control. So trusted ownership, least privilege methodology. We always believe in least privilege. Uh, if I leave, I don't give uh, you know, my babysitter my wallet. Instead, I give them my garage door code, right? That's least privilege. Uh, if a user needs to run a particular application in an elevated fashion, should we give that user administrative control on their machine or should we elevate the user for that one particular function? Now, uh, this is Steve Pickrell. He works for AppSense as well. Uh, don't trust this guy. He's a sales guy, right? <laughs> so he travels all over. We hook up to all different types of uh, projectors. Uh, he needs to be able to change the date and time on his computer. He needs to be able to defrag his drive. He needs to be able to change the display properties, right? Those are all legitimate things that Steve needs to do. But I'm not gonna give that guy administrative control over his machine. Instead, we put application manager on his machine and we elevate it for those three Windows controls. Very easy to do and it gives him least privilege availability. Now he can do his job. He can plug into all different types of projectors. He can install printers, but he can't go in and you know unjoin himself from the domain, right? So least privilege. Application network control. I'm very glad, by the way, we call this control instead of limits. And this is the test to see if anybody knows how to figure out an acronym. Um, but network control is controlling which host names, IP addresses, and port ranges any particular executable can reach on the network. So I can make it so that you can authenticate to the domain controller, but you can't RDP to the domain controller. I can make it so that you can get mail from the Exchange server, but you can't hit the Exchange server on port 80. I can make it so that you can access the file share, but you can't access the file share to the finance directory, regardless of, of where you are across the network. So it's a way of providing more control than typical NTFS. NTFS is either yes or no, but with network access control, I can actually say uh, this particular port from this particular type of process. So you can go to our SharePoint site from IE version 10, 
But you cannot hit that SharePoint site from IE version 6, nor can you hit it from Chrome. If you want that type of control, you can do that within our application manager construct. All of these additional features are there. I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, we are on the clock. Quick little quote from one of our customers. Uh, block run requests that were undetected by other uh, firewalls or antivirus software. Um, sometimes this is as easy as, uh, it, it, this, this honestly is true. You can OLE embed an executable into an email and then you can send someone, it'll bypass their filter because it sees it as an OLE linked application. Uh, so you could just bypass the filter that way. But I'm sure no one here knows how to get by, by a filter, right? We've never had to send each other an exe file and then just, you know, changed it to dot text and sent it, right? That, that's, that's never happened here, right? Um, right, it's against policy, but it sure works. Uh, and sometimes in IT, we do what works instead of what's according to policy. So uh, application manager can help make sure that when the, that does reach its intended recipient, when they launch the application, it doesn't launch unless it's met the approved list. Environment manager, who, what, when, where, how, uh, contextual based triggers. We replace all different types of login scripts and get users logged in significantly faster with our environment manager console. And it has all those different features, again, on the right. And a quote from El Camino Hospital, uh, we significantly drive up VDI adoption and uh, reduce uh, stuck VDI projects because there's this user resistance of having kind of a uh, brand new machine every time they log in or it's slow or I don't have all of my applications on that environment. So we solve those types of problems for people. And finally, Insight uh, gives you the analytics and metrics. Now, um, I do know that we're on the clock and I have a hard stop at 135. I might normally do a, uh, a demonstration. Instead, just a couple of points uh, around endpoint security. Predict, prevent, detect, and respond. This is a very industry standard methodology. Uh, AppSense can help you in all of these areas. We can help discover what applications users are using and help show what applications require administrative privilege or where they are connecting across the network to be able to predict what end users need. We can help prevent them from launching additional applications. We'll detect every application instantiation and every network request that those applications are making. And you can respond through building additional uh, contextual policies with our application manager. We think security um, is extremely critical and it's gonna be more and more important. You're only gonna see more and more of these breaches. There are a lot of them lately. Several of them with very big marquee names in town. Names that if I put their logo on the slide, I could be subject to a $250,000 fine. So I'm not gonna put their logo up on the slide, but it's big and red. I'll say that much, red. Um, those kind of breaches happen all around. And uh, we think removing administrative privilege and locking down end users to just trusted ownership is a good way to uh, help protect. Um, and we're able to solve those types of problems in the physical desktop world as well as the virtual world. So my last slide on here real quick, I just want to mention this is sort of outside of uh, work, but it's maybe a good networking opportunity for you. I happen to play cards on the side. Texas Hold'em is kind of a thing I do. We have a little IT group. We meet every couple months. We're up to about 20, 25 players. Play a tournament uh, style Texas No Limit Hold'em. This is uh, what the average participant looks like. Um, if you're interested, our next game is in the Twin Cities, uh, April 16th. Grab one of my business cards. I'd be glad to invite you. It's mostly all IT people. We also have, like Jim Yannick has come, Jeff Whitman from VMware. We have guys from VMware, Citrix, Microsoft, Best Buy, UHD, 3M. Very good IT-centric uh, group of guys and an occasional gal that play cards like complete monkeys. So, uh, any questions? Be glad to take them for you today. Anyone at all? Yes? I'll admit I don't know a lot about your product. But, yep. Um, you had mentioned putting um, App Manager or one of your products yep. on the desktop. So is there, it's client-based? Correct. We have an agent uh, that installs. I have a classic saying that agentless software is featureless. Uh, you have to have something on the endpoint in order to provide some controls. 
So we actually have filter drivers. They operate as drivers. They operate as a service on the endpoint. On the plus side, we get to control who can run those services because we do a lot with rights and privilege. That's a big part of our product. But yes, we do install an endpoint software. Uh, it is an agent. It's an MSI file. You can push it out with SCCM or you can push it out with our software. It runs as a service. That service has to be running. Um, and that service will then control either the logon experience, the personalization, the rights and privilege, or even CPU and memory footprint. But we operate as a filter driver. Uh, we are a core component of Windows. We run as system. And uh, we've been in this business for 15 plus years. So we've gotten rid of all the blue screens. Those are done as of seven years ago or so. So pleased to say, all gone. Yep. So is it a separate service for each product or one service for all? Uh, correct. There is a separate service for each component. There's an environment manager agent, there's an application manager agent, there's a performance manager agent. We also have an insight agent. That management center uh, is centrally controlled and it's a way to push out which agents. And uh, we do have a whole management infrastructure that can say, okay, these machines are all checking in and their services are all running. Um, uh, we also leverage a lot of customers use uh, third-party softwares to deliver those. And as I say, they're all MSIs. Uh, frequently, we're talking VDI, it's just baked into your golden image. You'd hardly even know the difference. Um, but as I say, agentless software is featureless. So if anybody comes and says, we're going to solve all your problems and we don't put any agents on your endpoint, just don't trust those people. Does the environment manager, I'm sorry, no, go ahead. take away those wonderful roaming profiles in Microsoft? Correct. We, we have gotten rid of roaming profiles entirely, but we give back all of the functionality of roaming profiles. So you can see your experience roam with you as you move device to device, but underneath you it's actually a mandatory profile or a local profile. Uh, for most of our customers, they start with keeping that roaming profile there until they make sure that all of their settings are in absence, and then they eliminate the roaming profile. Uh, but we're actually a layer above the profile, so we provide a layer of virtualization that if we don't capture those settings, it'll fall through to the local OS, so it might fall through to your roaming profile. Uh, but most organizations, they will rapidly get rid of roaming profiles in their entirety. We've taken, uh, a, a recent organization had one terabyte in storage from their roaming profiles. Uh, they're down to 50 gig. That's pretty significant. One twentieth of the disk storage requirement for profile settings was related to bloat within that profile. We had another question over here, yeah. <laughs> so funny. Uh, yes, uh, we are working diligently on Macintosh uh, clients. Uh, application manager in particular, you'll see a Mac client released by us by the end of the year. Uh, but environment manager, there's no Mac client yet. Yep. yep. On the insight agent, does that, does that roll up into the management center for reporting and things like that? Correct. It does, but it also has... It, it, it does roll up so you can, you can see which, which machines have that agent, but its reporting console, we have a, a virtual appliance. We found that that's actually easier for this type of a lightweight tool. Uh, we provide an OVF file that you can download. You can run it right on your VMware. You just import it as an appliance. And the only thing you give it is a name. And then when you install the agents, you just point at that name. There's already a certificate there. It communicates over HTTPS, and the reporting kind of comes via web console that way. Correct. You can see who all ran what and how frequently those things were run and then be able to uh, display your license compliance. Okay. We think most EULAs would prefer that there is license enforcement and so showing it with application manager that if I try and run this application from that workstation, it is denied. And if I run it from this workstation for which I paid a license, it is allowed. That can help you prove to the vendor uh, that you're in compliance with your licenses. So, uh, yep. Yeah, I have a question about the uh, privilege management piece. Yep. So um, you are mentioning that um, basically if there's a uh, certificate on the EFC or the application, or we can't trust source. How, how are those rules uh, managed? Is yeah. it, it is through our management console, and we have a lot of different ways to provide what we mean by a trusted vendor or a trusted certificate. 
Um, for example, Microsoft alone has 11 different certificates that they manage when they push out software. Uh, you can choose which of those 11 to trust. We also can tag based on metadata within the file. So with a particular file has something called the vendor tag, the version number. You can match those kind of things using wildcards, regular expression, explicit calls. Uh, we also match the digital signature using SHA or MD5 checksums. So you can actually force it to say this particular version. Now that's far more secure, but it also means more in administrative overhead. Because now every time the vendor changes their file, I need to go into my console and point to that particular application and say this is the new signature. That's also true as they change their certificates. Five years down the road, they'll have a new certificate. I'll need to import that certificate into my console and say I only trust things that come from this particular certificate. Okay. So then how, how, would that, how would those settings sync up then to like, say a client that's um, in the field and, like 100% of the time right, with no access to them? Right. Well, uh, they, they would definitely need to have at least some type of access to our network in order to be able to get the new version of the control. But within our management center, you could see how frequently those were checked in. And you can also set within our management console that there's like a timeout so that application manager will either turn off after so long of them not having checked in. Um, and another thing that is beneficial with Application Manager is that we have an ability for the user to launch the application using what's called a policy change request. And that policy change request, they'll ask for a, a, a code from the help desk. And they don't need to be online for that. They just can call in and say, this is my challenge code. Help desk enters it and gives them a response code. They enter in the response code, and that application could, be, could then be launched at that endpoint. So if they had a mission critical application on their endpoint, there would be a way to fail down to allow that user to run it. Um, but there's other options too. Like for example, we can go into a self-elevating mode and allow the user to run the stuff that they want on the fly. It's just that we'll then capture those and store them in an archive. So there's a lot of different choices. So they need access to the network on the not not 100%. I have a lot of customers that have users that are disconnected very frequently. But they do need to connect to the network every now and then in order to get updated policies. So maybe they need to check in once a month and log into the VPN or whatever. You can set their policy as you like. Well, you could, uh, and we do support that. We have some customers that do put our management center into the DMZ and put a certificate on it and let the users connect over HTTPS. It's just far more common than it would be on the inside of the network. So, Lots of good questions. Wow, it's like you guys were listening or something. If you haven't had a chance to register for the drawing and want to, just raise your hand on the form or you can come over and meet us at our table. Thanks, everybody, for your time.